Hello and a very warm welcome back to the teaching series Acts of Grace. Thank you for joining me again and we are going to go back into our teaching series and think some more about Stephen and particularly the trial of Stephen. I don't want to spend very long on this but I do want to at least just walk us through um, Stephen's presentation because he has some I think interesting things to say, and particularly interesting things to say um, to those of us who may find themselves on the cutting edge of criticism. So let's turn our Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 7. Uh, no, actually, let's, let's finish, in, finish Acts chapter uh, 6. Let me just reprise the last few verses of that. So Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, please. And remember, Stephen, full of grace and power, that was our theme from last time, uh, was doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. And we saw how some of those who belonged to the synagogues of the freedmen, as it was called, from the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and those from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and disputed with uh, Stephen. But they couldn't withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And we looked at that last time. And then, so they secretly instigated men who said, we heard him speak blasphemous words about Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came and seized him, brought him before uh, the council. And then they set up false witnesses against him, which is always the way. And so this man never ceases speaking words against this place and the law. Um, so of course the great uh, thing we've got to hear is that the two charges that are really spoken against him is that he's spoken against this place, in other words, the temple, the church, and of the institution, perhaps more importantly, and the law. And those two things are, are the key things that he's, 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 as far as they're concerned, have spoken against. Very, very important. And of course, this goes back to something that I spoke about when, we, when we've spoken around uh, the, the confusion and the need for the separation between understanding the difference between... Uh, the Word of God, the Logos, and the words of God that are contained in the Bible. But that's the John series, and I don't want to kind of get lost in that at the moment, but it just is interesting when you see it standing here. Um, so it says at verse 14, For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Now see, here the offence. This, this man is saying two things that are just unsayable. They're two things which they consider to be utterly unsayable. That number one, he's going to destroy this place, this institution of ours. He's going to destroy it and the law. So the things that the things that their faith are geared around, the things that their whole um, uh, walk with God is based on, is this place and the law. Now, of course, Christ is not only the end of the law. He's also the end of this place. And, and, and moving people from this place to the next place is really very important. And may I say that that is important not only in terms of, uh, of Bible teaching, but it's important in terms of life in general. And the whole, the whole industry has grown up around this theme of change management, of moving people from this place to the next place. And it's a very important conversation indeed. But he's going to change the customs, they say, that Moses gave us. And we can't have that under no circumstances. And gazing at him, it says, glaring at him, uh, all who sat in the council, they said, uh, and they saw that his face was like that of an angel. Well, we saw that last time. But let's touch the text in uh, chapter 7 now then, and see what happens here in chapter 7. So we have, uh, 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 we have um, Stephen stood before the council, and the thing, the, the thing we're going to see here, which I think is rather interesting, we're going to see, and I can think I've shown you this model time and time again in Scripture, in fact I'll show you it here, we're going to see that often that which we now revere, we once reviled. Let me say that again. That which we now revere, we once reviled. And that is because what we often call truth today starts its life oftentimes as being perceived as a heresy. So what we now consider to be truth often begins its life as a heresy. 
consider, for example, the case of eternal security. Uh, when you first uh, came into the grace teaching, uh, did it come as a, an extraordinary surprise to you when people talked about the idea of eternal security, that it wasn't possible for you to lose your salvation? Uh, many people that I can remember in our early days thought we were nuts when we used to speak about that. What began as a heresy is now a received truth, is now a wisdom. What you begin, now you revere once you re you reviled. Very important. And Stephen's going to make this point. Watch this. This is Stephen's speech. This is the only sermon that we have recorded as Stephen's. And of course, it's not the only one, but it's the only recorded one. And boy, what a, what a sermon it is too. Brothers and fathers, says Stephen, hear me. Now, first off, Stephen's very clear about this. He's talking to his brothers. He's not talking about outsiders. He's not talking about uh, people that are not part of what he's part of. He's talking about brothers. And it's important that we remember, very important that we remember, that we are brothers. Do you know, we've been having some meetings in London with a group of people that have very different ideas, uh, very, very different ideas uh, about how, what discipleship looks like, what training looks like. And it's been such a fascinating series of meetings because we've been learning different things from different people and growing as a result of it. And the one thing that holds us all together is that we all love God, that we're clear on that. And here's an interesting thing, these people all love God and Stephen is going to show them something about the God they love, something they don't know about the God they love. And it's an exciting thing, but they won't be able to hear it at this stage for reasons that I'll explain to you in a moment. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go also to the land that I will show you. Then he went out to the land uh, of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. After his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. He gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them for 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. Now let's just be clear about something because immediately what Stephen is wanting to remind us is the father of our faith, two big points, the father of our faith, beyond any dispute, the father of our faith, is claimed not just by us, but is claimed by all monotheistic faiths. The, 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 the Muslim people claim him, Islam claims him, Judaism claims him, Christianity claims him. Uh, now, this, this, this man has come, he's not come from nowhere, he's not a Jew, he's come from the land of, of Ur in the Chaldeans. He's come from a world that was very sophisticated, by the way, a world where they had trigonometry, a world where they had central heating, could you imagine? In the ancient world, this man was a moon worshipper, but this is the one that's going to be called the father of faith. Uh, he starts a journey, and I think you'd have to say that he would be one who would be reviled for who he was. But he is the father of faith. And interestingly enough, being the father of faith, you might want to know this, that uh, Stephen tells us straight away that the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land. Now we know from, the, from our studies of Genesis, we know that God spoke to him in Haran as well. And that tells us something important. It, simply saying this, that God called Abraham a second time. And it's very interesting for, you to, for us to understand that because the fact of the matter is sometimes we need to be called by God more than once, don't we? We receive our Mesopotamian call, but our Mesopotamian call is not something necessarily we can follow in its fullness. 
uh, in fact, to, to be entirely clear about that, we know very, very well that when uh, Abraham was called, he was called to leave everything, to leave his kindred, to leave everything, and just to go out. But he doesn't do that, does he? He brings with him Lot, who's the picture of the worldly believer, and all the problems that comes with that, and, and that in itself is an extraordinary story. And he brings his father with him. And what we see, interestingly, is when his father, is his father Terah, I can't remember now off the top of my head, but anyway, his father Terah, or Nahor, I forget which one it is, Terah, I think, um, his name means delay. And what's interesting is that it's after his father dies he moves on. And this is very important because what happens, uh, and Abraham's a picture of this, he has the first response of faith, and the first response of faith is, is not to go out by himself, he needs some help with that. And his father and his cousin and nephews and everybody else go with him, and they almost kind of push him out of Ur, of the, of, 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 of the, of the Chaldeans. He, they push him out in that first wave of faith, but his faith journey only takes him as far as the eye can see. He comes and settles in a place called Haran. And he would have stayed in Haran forever and ever and ever had his father lived forever and ever. But actually, the scripture tells us after his father died, do you see? And it's important because it's the, it's the passing away of his father. This is here in verse 4. It's the passing away of his father that the Lord calls him again and removed him. As I said, his name means delay. Now, it may be that you have been moved out of Ur of the Chaldeans. You may have left the Mesopotamia of legalism. You may have said yes to the message of grace and begun your journey. Who knows, maybe gone with a group of people, maybe gone with a, a group that have kind of walked away from a church movement. I don't know. But you've, you've said, no, we don't believe in that Meso Mesopotamian theology anymore. We don't believe in the gospel of, uh, of, of, of law, and of law, of up and down, of, of, of you know, hi ho, hi I owe, I owe, it's off the church I go. You don't believe in that anymore. And so you've moved out of that and you've moved into this wonderful dimension that you call grace. But I just want to say something to you and, 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 and I say it as lovingly as possible. Uh, be careful it's not a Haran because Haran is as far as it goes before you move across into the desert space and you move across into the real adventure with God. Oh, it's a wonderful thing to leave behind the teaching of law. It's a wonderful thing to be free in Christ. It's a wonderful thing to spend your life discovering about who, what your identity is. But beloved, we're called for more than that. We're called to go into the promised land. And too many of us, I fear, have uh, dwelling in Haran. We're not in Mesopotamia, I agree. We're not in the institution anymore, but we didn't deconstructed ourselves, but we've not reconstructed ourselves. We've not recreated ourselves in the new way, in the promised land, in the new hope, in the dream. We've, we've forsaken so many of the things that are still, I think, important and the, the key things about community and living and loving and sharing the life of Christ together and, and, and the being who we are in Christ. It's a very, very important part of our narrative. And yet so many of us in the great community kind of shy away from that because we don't want to have that conversation but it may take for you it may take uh, uh, the father to die it may take that the first wave of grace to die in you before you'll move on to the next thing and I'm, I'm not saying there's another subject I'm simply saying there's a deeper revelation there's a much deeper revelation the deeper revelation to me of from law and grace is life and life is a far deeper, far richer, far more exciting revelation. And it may mean that you have to, you, something has to die in you to move you from that. Because, beloved, don't get stuck in Haran. You must move on. And the Lord said to him, go out from there. And he removed him in, 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 and placed him into this land in which we're now living, this promised land, this land that is ours, ours in Christ. Uh, now, and so we have this, this initial story, and we have the story of Abraham, and, and, and he tells us um, that Abraham has our patriarchal fathers. He, uh, you know the story. He, has, he begets Isaac, Isaac begets Jacob, and Jacob begets the twelve. And from Jacob, the line follows down now uh, through to Joseph. And read something interesting, verse 9. And the, uh, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him, and rescued him out of all of his afflictions, and he found favour with the Pharaoh. Uh, and now watch, watch this. Jealous of Joseph, oh my goodness. Joseph was one of the twelve. He was the dreamer. And let me promise you that those of you who are the dreamers probably know what it means to have those around you who are jealous of you, even your own kindred. And here they sold him. 
And maybe you're in a situation, even as you watch this video, where you feel as though you've been betrayed by those who've loved you. You feel maybe you've been betrayed by your own uh, community in which you've been living. Maybe you've been a member of the Grace community for a long time and have seen something more, have seen a deeper revelation, have become a dreamer, have become a seer, have become one who looks deeper into the beyond, who looks more into the midst, and is starting to talk and uh, speak a language of inclusion that is making people nervous and starting to get people to pull away from you. Well, let me tell you something. If you get sold to Egypt, don't you worry about it because God was with Joseph and he'll be with you. And he rescued him out of all his afflictions and he gave him favor and wisdom before the Pharaoh. Well, that's a wonderful thing to have. The king of Egypt and he made him ruler over all of his household. Now there came a famine throughout Egypt and Canaan and great affliction and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out uh, our fathers on their first visit. And on their second visit, Joseph made himself known. Ah, uh, that's a nice thought. Because look at this now. This is a kind of image of the type of Christ. On the first visit, the first wave of grace, uh, I've gone to, I've gone to the Egypt. I've gone to receive my grain, and I've gone on a ferry backwards and forwards. And of course, Benjamin. There's a whole story that's attached to that. But it's on the second visit that Joseph makes himself known. And there's something I think quite significant about that. That it's, he makes himself known to his brothers, and Joseph uh, and the family keep him known to the Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died there and our father, uh, with our fathers. And they carried him back to Shechem and laid him in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from Hamor in Shechem. So we have the story of Joseph. Joseph not accepted, Joseph rejected, Joseph cast out of his family, but Joseph becoming a redeemer. Next verse. But as the time you promised you near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and they multiplied in Egypt, verse 18, until there arose in Egypt another king who didn't know Joseph. Hmm. Unfortunately, there will always be those who rise who don't know the Lord. And he dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to, ex to expose their infants so they could not be kept alive. Verse 20. At this time Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he, he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought her up as his own son. Well, I like him a lot because he's an adopted son, and that's a very interesting uh, metaphor for somebody like me. And, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. Well, of course, you're going to remember there's something of a disconnect there, aren't there? Because by the time that Moses gets his call in the wilderness, uh, he starts fumbling around saying to the Lord, well, I, 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 I can't speak, I've got no idea. But no, 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 he was mighty in words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, verse 23, it came into his heart to visit his brothers. Now, there may be people that are listening to this who are, 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 are thinking that they're moving past the period of usefulness. And by dear Lord, please don't think 40 is past the time of usefulness. On the contrary, uh, as someone who's in their 50s, I certainly hope not. But the interesting thing is, it, it, didn't, it wasn't until he was his 40s that the Bible tells us that it came into his heart to visit his brothers. There may be many things ahead for you. There may be a whole life of ministry ahead for you. But at this, as yet, nothing has come into your heart. But that, please don't lose heart, because once the Lord's put something in you, it will come out. And we see now Moses is the one who, into whose heart something is going to come. And seeing one of them wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. Verse 25, key verse. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving salvation to them through his hand, but they did not understand. Beloved, <laughs> I, one of the soundest pieces of advice I've ever been given is seek first to understand and then to be understood. But you need to understand that although you have come to bring freedom and hope and love and life to people, not everybody will understand that. And in fact, as the case of Moses, this is going to be cause Moses to come into a real trauma of his faith. Well, now, I'm going to pause today because we've run long enough, but we'll pick this up next time. And I just want you to understand a couple of things as we close. 
Number one, Joseph simply had a dream and he shared it. And that dream caused people to be very jealous of him. And that jealousy caused him to be exiled. So they threw him away, literally gave him up for dead. But God never gave him up for dead. God was working all the time. It was, in fact, it was all working together for good. The Lord had sent him ahead to save life. Moses, Moses grew up in all of the wealth and all of the affluence of Egypt. And suddenly when he was 40 years of age, not even knowing his people, not even growing with his people, but when he was 40 years of age, God put it in his heart that he needed to visit his people. And he thought that the people would understand that he'd come to redeem them, but they didn't understand that. But now, remember now, we're looking at something here where Stephen has begun by saying, the accusation against Stephen is that they are saying that this Moses, they're going to cast aside the things that Moses gave us. Well, my beloved friends, Moses began his life as being reviled. But now look, he's revered. You continue to worry not about your reputation. Just follow the instincts and the things that God is showing you. And whether they revile you or whether they revere you makes no difference. God will accept you. Until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye.